Um, so the plan for today, um, we're going through yoga for beginners and we're just going to spend a little bit of time going through posture by posture, getting kind of in-depth breakdowns into some of the basics that you'll see throughout many different yoga classes, whether you're taking classes with me or with really any other teacher. Um, and then after about a half an hour, if you're on Zoom, you can jump in, ask questions at any time. I'm leaving you guys all unmuted so that you can ask questions throughout. Um, we'll take a break um, and then we'll put all that together in kind of a little mini flow um, so that you can start to understand how the, the movements relate to each other and how the, um, how the transitions between some of the postures work. Um, so like I said, any questions, um, for those of you that are on Zoom, you can jump in Instagram Live. I'm probably not going to be able to see your questions from far away, um, but you're always welcome to jump into Zoom. The um, information for the Zoom invite is available on bostonyogaonline.com. Uh, so you can switch over to Zoom if that's easier for you. Um, let's just take like a moment to stretch together first. I'm going to make my way to my mat. Um, and... Uh, you can have a seat on your mat. The other thing I'll say is as we're going through, um, I'm going to be holding postures for a really long time so that I can talk about all the different things that are going on with them. And I would encourage you to try the posture as we first go into it. And then if your legs are getting tired, if stuff is getting tired, come out of it, listen for a little bit as I continue to talk. Maybe try it out a couple more times, but don't feel like you have to hold the posture the entire time because that, that would be a lot. Um, so first thing, just to kind of get settled in, we often start classes in child's pose. There are two different types of child's pose. We normally start in extended child's pose. So bring your toes together behind you and your knees out kind of as wide as your elbows. Oops, the video just went off for some reason. Let me switch that back on. Um, so knees out as wide as is comfortable for your body. Stretch your fingertips in front of you and start to relax your head around. All right, come on, video. Um, you can relax your chest in. The other form of child's pose that we'll sometimes take is with your knees actually right underneath you and your hands flat at your sides. By the way, forehead on the ground. Um, if you're pretty tight in your hips, your hips might be lifted up in space a little bit here. That's fine. Think about trying to pull them back towards your heels. Um, this is always an optional posture. For my class, I think really for any class, you can always sit on your heels and just sit in space. You can sit with your legs crossed. Um, a lot of people will have you start out in Shavasana instead of in a child's pose or in a seat. Um, and that's always an option for you as well. So that's kind of the, the first posture that we often transition through. Um, the next posture that I want to talk about is mountain pose. So we're going to go through um, mountain and kind of all the things related to mountain. So come up to stand. Um, mountain pose sounds simple because you think, oh, I'm just standing with my hands straight up. That's true. <laughs> um, but I want you to think about a couple things beyond that. So when I'm standing here, my feet are together underneath me. In particular, my big toes are together and my heels are actually about an inch apart. And I stand up, shoulders directly over the top of the hips. My ears are over the top of my shoulders. So we often kind of have our heads forward in space. Think about pulling your ears over your shoulders. Hands go up towards the ceiling. See what it feels like to roll your ears up into your shoulders and then release them. Press them back down. Press your shoulders as far away from your ears as you can. Maybe rotate your fingers towards each other slightly. Your pinkies come towards each other. Maybe your elbows even bend and your hands come out in front of you. And that's what helps you to release your shoulders away from your ears. So that, that can be your version of mountain pose. I'm also pulling my belly button towards my spine as hard as I can. I'm squeezing my inner thighs together really hard and kind of lifting up on my kneecaps. So there's a lot of engagement going on here in your mountain pose. Um, the reason I want to make sure you've got that set up is mountain is kind of the foundation for a lot of different poses we'll do. So when we talk about high play, it would be the same thing but with hands out in front of you and down on the ground. When we talk about Shavasana, it's really just a mountain pose. Lots of different things have that same base as mountain pose. So that's where we start. Let's hinge all the way down to the ground. Bend your knees as much as is comfortable, as much as you want to here. And that's one of the things that you're going to hear me say a lot over the next hour. Um, bend knees are okay. Bend knees are fine. 
So forward fold right here, pretty standard. Same thing, toes together, heels about an inch apart. We often move from here into halfway lift. So for halfway lift, bring your hands onto your shins or onto your thighs, wherever it makes sense for you, so that you can try to get your torso parallel to the ground. And pull your shoulder blades together behind you. Like you're trying to squeeze a pencil in between your shoulder blades. Rock your weight slightly into the ball mounds, into your tiptoes of your feet. Think about pressing your collarbone forward. Notice my legs are not completely straight here. I might straighten my legs, maybe that's what feels good to me. But if it makes more sense in your body to keep your knees bent so that you can get that rock forward and your back nice and flat, you can always take that. So that's your high plank. Pull the shoulder blades together, back, flatten out your back. And let's pl try planting our hands so all the way back to a high plank pose. So like I said, this is mountain pose, but on um, facing the mat instead of standing up. You can always come down to your knees here from high plank. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think high plank is probably the number one place where we develop bad habits in our yoga practice. Um, I want you to think about pressing out the space between your shoulders as much as you can. So you're rotating the outside of your shoulder blades towards the ground and rounding out between your back. Gaze is between the tops of your pointer fingers, maybe about six inches in front of your face to make the back of your neck nice and long. Isometrically pull the heels of your hands and the tips of your toes together. Let's get engage your low core. Notice that my hips are about in line with my shoulders here. I'm not dropping them down, bringing kind of a little bit of sway into my low back. They're actually puffed up and in line with my shoulders. That's a high plank. Come down to your knees for a second if you haven't already. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of core strength. And we go through high plank a lot during practice. So you're always welcome to take high plank from your knees. Just takes a little bit of the weight out of it so you're not holding up your entire body weight. Um, you only have everything from the hips up. So it's the same thing on your knees. Same kind of pop up between your shoulders. Um, just knees come straight down to the ground. Um, so we go through high plank to low plank. That's our Chaturanga Dandasana, upward facing dog, downward facing dog, a lot. Um, I'm going to talk through down dog really quickly with you. And then I'm going to show you a couple different options that you have in Chaturanga and talk about um, why you might want to use different ones. So let's find down dog first. Find your high plank to start with, and then just send your hips towards the ceiling. Ideally, that's where we would want to be with down dog. If you feel like your hands and your feet aren't completely stable here, walk your feet in a couple inches. So with down dog, use your low core muscles to send your hips high. That's kind of where the impetus of the motion comes from. Your feet are hips width distance apart. Your hands are shoulder width distance apart. Take the inside of your elbows and rotate those towards the top of your mat. Take the inside of your knees and rotate those towards the back of your mat. So your shoulders and your legs are kind of internally rotating and then turning out. With this, my heels are on the ground here. I have really flexible long hamstrings here though. Um, from many years of practicing yoga and just straight genetics. If that's not the case for you, if you can't get your back flat and your ears kind of in between your elbows and the down dog with your heels on the ground, start by lifting your heels and then maybe bend your knees. And you can have your knees and your heels bent as much as works for you um, to make this pose feel right in your body. I would rather have you with really bent knees, really high lifted heels than kind of a rounded back that looks more like this. So if you're, if you're feeling like this and your head is out in front of your elbows, see if you can bend your knees and have that allow you to pull your chest towards the top of your thighs and get your hips a little bit higher. That's downward facing dog. Again, if you want to take a seat, I'm going to talk through different chaturanga options. You're welcome to go through them with me. Um, so chaturanga, usually start from a half lift, from a forward fold. We'll go through that half lift, press into the legs, then plant the hands directly underneath the shoulders. Step your feet all the way back. Inhale, shift forward as far as you possibly can. Exhale, lower halfway. My elbows are squeezing in tight to my sides. On inhale, I flip onto the tops of my feet, 
here in my upward facing dog, I'm pressing my feet into the ground as hard as, as I can. My legs are engaged to lift my knees, and I'm pressing my chest out in front of me. My gaze stays in front of me, maybe a little bit up. Exhale, downward facing dog, curl the toes under, send the hips up and back. So that's a traditional Chaturanga Dandasana. Um, one of the biggest things that I see as people are just learning yoga, as they're just starting to build up their strength, is from this high plank, rather than continuing to press up between their shoulders as they lower down, they'll collapse like that and then lower from there. And if you feel yourself doing that, and I would say the number one marker of that is you'll feel your hips start to drop to the ground before your upper body starts to drop to the ground on that chaturanga. What I want you to do is instead of shifting forward, lowering halfway there, I want you to put your knees to the ground first, then shift forward, then lower halfway. From there, everything else is the same. Inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. And I know I am one of those people, I do not like to be told um, that I can't do something or I'm not there yet. I'm very competitive with myself and others, so it's hard for me to kind of take a step back and be like, today, my shoulders are not strong enough, um, or I don't have enough energy in my shoulders to take that full chatter on the push up. Um, but particularly, particularly as you're starting out, make sure that you've got that form down first, that you're able to squeeze the elbows in tight and keep your chest rounded up all the way through to halfway, and then lift um, up to your upward facing dog, and bring your knees down if not, because um, our bodies are kind of incredible. Our muscle memory is really amazing, and our bodies learn patterns and routines really fast. So if you're learning a pattern and routine where your shoulders are protracting as you lower down, that's what's going to be embedded in your practice for a very long time. Um, so you're better off coming down to your knees and learning that nice, um, firm, steady um, high plank to low plank with your knees on the ground and building up the strength there until you can pull your knees up and take the full high plank to low plank. So that's just my, my two cents on it and my feeling about um, taking different variations. The other thing that might happen is if you are tight in your low back, the upward facing dog might not feel good to you. So you've got two options if upward facing dog doesn't feel good. One is just to hold high plank the entire time. So I'll say inhale, halfway lift, exhale, chaturanga dandasana, high to low plank. You'll come to high plank, I'll say inhale, upward facing dog, you're still hanging out here, exhale, downward facing dog, you'll send your hips up and back. That way you're not going through that transition with the upward facing dog. You don't have to bend into your low back. Great option. The other thing you can do if you still really want to work on building that shoulder strength, this is actually, I would say this is like a level up, but if you are feeling strong in your shoulders and you want to give yourself a challenge, you can still do that shift forward, lower halfway, but then instead of shifting to upward facing dog, press straight back to high plank and then to downward facing dog. Again, if you're practicing that, that chaturanga push-up with your elbows tucked in tight is really tough. So you can always come down to your knees and do the chaturanga push-up from your knees and then find your high plank downward facing dog. So different options. Anybody have any questions um, about chaturanga? <laughs> Mia, who's here in the room with me, has a question. I have a question about downward facing dog. Yeah. Which is, are your shoulder blades pulled in together or are you, is your back puffed up? So, you, uh, so Mia's question, if you didn't hear, was in downward facing dog, are your shoulder blades together or is your back puffed up? It's not puffed up exactly, but you are trying to pull your shoulder blades around to the front. And that's, that's why when we think about turning our elbows to the front of the room, that action wraps our shoulder blades kind of around towards the front of the body. So rather than collapsing into the shoulders there, we're rounding out a little bit. Um, it makes it a little bit tougher to get that flat back, and that's where that core strength comes in to send your hips even higher in your downward facing dog. Um, so a little bit of both, I would say. Uh, so that, those are kind of like the basics of Chaturanga, which I would say is really the core of most yoga practices. Um, we're going to get into some standing postures. Before I go into standing postures, I want to say one thing about how we get to standing postures. So we often transition to standing postures from a downward facing dog, 
and then you'll hear somebody say, inhale, three-legged dog. That just means lift your toes to the ceiling. The trick here is you don't, the goal isn't just to get your hips or your toes as high as you possibly can, force your foot up and open up your hips. Try to keep your hips square in that three-legged dog, which might mean that your toes only come this high. But try to keep the weight in your hands even and your hips square to the ground. And then we'll generally step through to a low lunge. And then note on that step to a low lunge. If you have short arms, it's difficult. And you might step and your foot lands here. And then you have to take another step and another step and another step. And that's fine. It's just the way your left arm body is put together. Um, it's a perfectly reasonable place to be. If you're trying to work really hard on getting that full step through, See if you can rise up onto the ball mound of your back foot. Think about touching your knee to your nose and then stepping your foot down. It's kind of going to be your best bet for getting your foot all the way through. Moving to the crescent lunge. So first big standing posture. Let's set up on the ground first. So left foot is behind me, my right foot is forward. You can switch with whichever side you're on and switch as we're moving through. My back toes are curled under. I'm starting with my knee on the ground. But notice right away my right knee is over the top of my right ankle. From here, I'm going to start to straighten out my back leg and press up towards the ceiling. My hands go straight up, same arms as in mountain pose. So the same hands towards the ceiling, press your shoulders back away from your ears. Maybe your pinkies rotate towards each other slightly. We're working to get our hips square straight towards the top of the mat here and to take sway out of the low back. So I can get really low into my front knee here. I can bend really low into it by going like this, having this huge curve in my back. But I want to flatten out that curve. So the way I find easiest to kind of notice where my pelvis is and where that tilt of the pelvis is, is I bend my back knee. I come down. That's where it's easy for me to flatten out my pelvis. And then I slowly start to straighten out my back leg as much as I can while maintaining the neutral pelvis and hips pointing straight forward. That's just a little bit of a, a trick to help you think about where your pelvis is in space. Um, so on this pose, the, what I, so what I want you to focus on here is the neutral pelvis. If that means that your back knee is more bent, it means your back knee is more bent. If it means you're coming out of the bend in the front knee, it means you're coming out of the bend in the front knee. But your pelvis stays neutral and your hips stay pointed forward your shoulders stay away from your ears. That's crescent lunge, warrior two. I'm gonna switch into my other knee so that I don't burn out all the muscles in my right quad. Um, so set up for this point, your, your front toes, I'm on my left toes, are going straight forward towards the center of my mat. My right foot is back pretty wide behind me. My right toes are angled just slightly up towards the top corner of my mat. So they're not parallel, they're not pigeon-toed out, or they're not uh, wide out, they're slightly pigeon-toed in, rather. My hips are right over the top of, or my hips, my shoulders are stacked. From here, I'm gonna bend into the front knee, so I'm bending into my left knee, and I'm gonna press into the outside of both heels, my hands. Hands stretch apart nice and wide, gaze is soft over the left fingertips. This is warrior two. Things to think about in warrior two. As soon as we start to bend into the front knee, notice my body started, my torso started going forward. I'm going to shift that back in space, get my shoulders over the top of my hips. The goal is to get your torso parallel to the edge of your mat. So if you notice right now, whatever knee you're bent into, that shoulder's probably a little bit back behind the other one. See if you can use your oblique muscles to rotate yourself more parallel to the side of your mat. Squeeze your shoulder blades together behind you here. Press your bent knee open over the outside of your foot. Work towards and we're working towards a 90 degree bend in the front leg, and you don't have to be there. You can bring your feet in closer to each other if that's more comfortable for you, particularly if we're kind of holding this for a while. See if you can lift the inside arch of your back foot a little bit. So this is your warrior two, maybe come, shake it out a little bit. Um, we're going to stay in those legs for a while. Warrior two is the foundation for a lot of different postures through our practice. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind is that um, 
a lot of postures have kind of the same base legs, and you can just listen for little cues that tell you what your torso is doing differently. Um, so anytime you say reverse, and then a, the name of a posture you know, it probably means that the legs are staying exactly the same, and your, the hands are going to go up to the ceiling instead of down towards the ground or instead of straight up. Um, so that's true for reverse warrior, it's true for reverse triangle. Um, and then similarly, if we say revolve, it generally means the hands stay exactly the same, or the legs stay exactly the same, and the torso twists to face the opposite direction than what you're used to. So from here, if I say reverse warrior, all that means is my left hand is going up to the ceiling, my right hand is coming around behind my back, or it can left rest on your right leg. Just don't want a lot of weight in that. A lot of people here, when they hear reverse, they think, oh, I have to reach back. And that can look nice, but I want you to think about as a goal here, finding a stretch between the intercostal muscles, so between the muscles uh, in your rib cage there. And to achieve that, you really have to sink into the hip, sink deeper into the lunge, and lift as high as you can with that left hand. Once your hand is as high as you can get it, maybe that's where you start to tip back a little bit. But my legs are staying exactly where they were. There's a really huge um, temptation to, as your hand lifts, to lift out of that bent knee a little bit. See if you can keep that knee low and long and pressing over the outside of the left knee. So that's reverse warrior. Extended side angle, same legs as warrior two. I'm going to switch, so I'm bent into my right knee here. So if you want to switch with me, you can do that as well. Exact same legs. Okay, I gaze over my front fingertips, so for me that's my right fingertips. I'm going to press into my left foot to reach my right hand as far forward as I can possibly get it. And once I'm reaching as far as I can, I just tick-tock my arms in space to bring my right elbow down to my right knee. You can actually rest your right elbow on your right knee here. Now you might have noticed when I did that, when I went to rest my right elbow on my knee, I went from this kind of lifted, extended position, like hunched over a little bit. We want to avoid that where possible. So see if even when your right elbow is on your knee, instead of letting your left shoulder drop towards the floor, you can rotate it up. Think about lifting the left side ribs up towards the ceiling. In general, our hands go straight up here, but there's always the option to reach your top hand out overhead. And notice, now I have this line of energy that goes from the outside of my left hand all the way through my left fingertips. Um, and that's really what we're aiming towards. That's where you can kind of get the indicator for the depth of your posture and whether you're kind of rotating and lifting out of that as much. So rather than thinking about extended side angle as a reach down towards the ground, look at that. When I touch the ground, my shoulder collapsed down towards the ground. So instead of that, it's a lift up and out. All right. Any questions from anyone on those kind of base standing postures so far? Yeah. <laughs> so when you're in warrior two, mm -hmm. um, are your hip bones slightly at a 45 or are you trying to get your hip bones headlighted? Yeah, great question. So we're get, trying to get our hip bones headlighted towards the side of the room so as well. Just the torso. Yeah, not just the torso. So the, you, it's hard, you're not going to be able to get them completely headlighted towards the side because you want to keep pressing the knee open over the outside of the foot. But as much as possible, trying to get them kind of headlighted towards the side of the room. Now, one more kind of big standing posture that's used pretty often is triangle pose. Um, and that is different in the hip orientation than the, the warrior series. Actually, there's two more that we'll talk about, warrior one and triangle. Um, for triangle, start with your feet, um, not hips with distance, a little bit wider than hips with distance underneath you. Um, I'm going to go to the right, so I'm going to point my right toes straight towards the top of my mat. So my feet are forming a T, basically, underneath me. My left foot is completely parallel to the back of my mat. My right toes are pointing straight forward. Then from here, I'm going to pop my hips back. I'm kind of hand on my hip, leaning into my, putting my weight into my left foot. And that allows me to stretch my torso forward. Now here, think about that like center point of your tailbone behind you. Think about pulling that towards your left heel. 
So I'm pulling that towards my left heel. I'm gonna reach my right hand out as far as I can possibly get it, just like in that extended side angle. And then again, tick tock my hands down to the ground. And just like in that extended side angle, it's the rotation up of the left shoulders towards the ceiling rather than trying to get the hand on the ground. This is a difficult posture though. So if you want to bring your hand onto your shin for some support, if you want to bring your hand onto a block, I found that a case of gear is actually kind of the exact right height as a block, so you can do that as well. Our goal in this triangle pose is to get our torsos parallel to the ground and our hands reaching up, our gaze going up, but that's a lot. So if your feet are closer in underneath you and you're just like this, that's a great place to be. It's also a lot of work for the legs and sometimes we forget that and we allow our legs to not really do anything. So if you were just doing that pose and you're like, oh yeah, I kind of feel it, but it doesn't seem like it's that hard, try this. Try going into that pose that will reach forward, 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 pop your hips back, then reach down, and then micro bend your front knee. So the leg that was straight, bend it a little bit, and then pull your heels together underneath you as hard as you can. Remember, point the tailbone down towards the back heel, pull your belly button towards your spine to engage your core, and maybe from here, start to stretch your bottom arm out in front of you. Maybe even try to reach the other hand up overhead like you're giant, grabbing a giant beach ball. Whew. Holy crap, that's a lot of nose leaks. That's a lot of core work there. So that is triangle pose. It is a tough one. Um, it's not something that comes naturally to us. Um, so there is a tendency there to lock out the joints just kind of hinge forward and be like, oh, I can hold this. Remember to lift up and out, rotate up, re-engage the legs. Lots of different stuff going on in triangle. Um, the last big um, standing pose is warrior one, and I save it to the last because it is a tricky one. Um, for me, at least, in my body, it's not something that feels supernatural. So come up to stand again. I'm going to point my right toes. I'm going to bend into the right knees for first. So my right toes are pointed straight towards the top of my mat. And just like we had in triangle pose, it's not that super long stance. Um, my foot is a little bit closer underneath me. I'm gonna bend into my right foot here. And right away, I wanna put the entire left heel, the entire back heel down onto the ground. I know it's tempting to lift the heel. Let's see if you can press it down to the ground. If you need to take your foot like a foot wider, or if you need to put your foot way in underneath you, so that your feet are like barely even hips with distance apart, you can do that. If that's what allows you to get your back foot onto the ground, take that variation. Change up where your feet are. You'll heel, hear teachers say we're aiming for heel to heel alignment. So like imagine there was a line bisecting your yoga mat. You're trying to step both heels onto it. But that's not going to be right in everybody because some of us have deeper hip sockets. <laughs> Our hip, hips just don't rotate that much. So get both heels onto the mat first, bend into the front knee a little bit, and take your hands for a second here, bring them onto your hips. Notice now, take a look at where your elbows and your knees are, your elbows and your legs in particular. So right now, if I were just to bend into this, everything's at acute angles for me. There's not much space between the direction my right elbow is pointing and the direction my right knee is pointing. And I wanna make all of those into 90 degree angles. So I'm gonna press really hard into my left foot, into the outside of my left foot, and that rotates my left hip forward so that now I'm at all 90 degree angles. My elbows are pointing straight out to the sides of my mat. My legs are pointing straight forwards and back. I'm pressing the back of my left knee up towards the ceiling too. And if to get there, you have to come a little bit out of bend in your front knee, do that. You can come out of that bend in your knee. The other thing to think about, rather than just pressing your left hip back, think about the inseam of your left leg um, and think about how that goes all the way up really into that hip joint. You're gonna rotate that inseam towards the back of the room, the rotation of the hip joint in the socket to press your hip towards the front of the room. Now again, this is a place where I want you to look out for your pelvic alignment because it's tempting to go like this. I've got that big, I call it cheerleader butt, my butt sticking out way behind me. But I want to re-engage my core, point my tailbone down, and that again might mean that I come out of the bend in my front knee a little bit. 
Arms from warrior one, same as mountain pose, same as crescent lunge. Hands just reach up overhead, maybe rotate your pinky, then press your shoulders away from your ears. Come out of the bend of that knee a little bit for a moment. Shake it out. Um, one thing that I want to talk about from Warrior One is that we'll often go into other transitions from Warrior One. So you will often have teachers go from Warrior One, find an interlace behind your back, bring your palms together, and from here, maybe they'll go into like a toppling tree and float your left foot back. More commonly, you're going to see people go into Humble Warrior. So I'm going to switch into my left knee, bending into my left knee. Then you can just watch this or you can follow along. So I'm bringing my hands together behind me, um, fast at your with my fingers. I'll puff up my chest to start, continue to press the right hip forward. And I'm gonna bend forward and drop my head down towards the ground. This is a balance, guys. So make yourself a wider stance if that helps you to find the balance. Try to avoid opening up your hips towards the side. Try to keep pressing hard into your back foot and rotating the inseam of the back leg towards the back of the room. All of those muscles in your legs, in your core, everything has to be tensed and engaged to maintain your balance. Think about magnetizing your inner thighs and pulling them together, and then release the back of your neck. Find something small to look at behind you to keep your balance. You can always come down and out of that. That's a big one. That's, um, I think, probably one of the more difficult balances um, in yoga because we use it a lot. Um, and not everybody prepares you and tells you that it's a balance you're coming into. So it's a little bit tricky. Um, but, you know, give yourself a little bit of um, credit for going into it at all because it's a really difficult posture. That's one that's hard to think about all the different things that are engaged um, and the things that you have to kind of release to find um, that balancing pose. So that's kind of, that's the basic poses that form kind of the core of our yoga practice. Anybody have questions about any of those poses, any of the things I talked about in the last 30 minutes? I'm going to just check Instagram to make sure we're not getting any questions through there. All right. Um, grab some water if you want to. What we're going to go into next, we're going to do a little kind of mini flow. So we're going to put together those, those poses in sequence. It's always good to start to, um, I think the, ch the challenging thing for a lot of people is they understand what the poses are. Um, they've heard the names before, but remembering what pose you're supposed to get into when you just hear the name of a pose is tricky. So that's what we're going to work on a little bit hearing the name of the pose and knowing where you're going from there. It'll just be a brief flow, then we're going to have a little bit of time to stretch because I know I'm sweating <laughs> I'm out of breath already <laughs> and I'm sure that some of you are as well. So as you're ready, meet me in downward facing dog. So bring your hands to hips width distance, feet to, or hands to shoulder width distance, feet to hips width distance, and start to send your hips up and back towards the ceiling. Remember, option to bend your knees, option to lift your heels, but wherever you are, rotate the inside of your elbows forward to create more space across your back, and the inside of your knees towards the back of the room. Press hard into the pads of your fingers, spread your fingers wide apart here. Start to find a little bit of stillness. Sink into your version of down dog. Inhale, look towards your hands, bend your knees. Exhale, step your feet to the top of your mat, bring your toes together, heels about an inch apart. Inhale, halfway lift, press into your legs, rock forward into the ball rounds of your feet, squeeze your shoulder blades together. Exhale, forward fold, hinge down to the ground. Inhale, mountain pose, rise up, use your core for control, bring your hands to the ceiling, breathe here for a moment, roll your shoulders away from your ears. Magnetize your inner thighs towards each other. Inhale. Exhale, forward fold, hinge from your hips. Draw your hands through heart center or wide down to the mat. Inhale, halfway lift, rock forward, squeeze your shoulder blades, flatten out your spine. Exhale, high to low plank, chaturanga, but or your variation. 
Step as far back as you can. Inhale, shift forward. Exhale, lower halfway down. Squeeze your elbows in tight. Inhale, upward facing dog. Press into the tops of your feet. Lift your knees. Exhale, downward facing dog. Send your hips up and back to the ceiling. Inhale, three-legged dog. Right toes high. Keep your hips square to the ground. Exhale, low lunge. Maybe rise onto the bottom mound of your back foot. Shift your knee all the way forward. Step your foot in between your hands or work your foot up there. Inhale, crescent lunge. Sweep your hands up to the ceiling. Rise off your back knee. Breathe for a moment here. Again, maybe check the alignment of your pelvis by bending into your back knee for a moment, re-straightening out your pelvis, then press your knee up. Inhale. Exhale, warrior two. Spin your back heel down to the mat. Sweep your hands out to the sides. Gaze is soft over your right fingertip. Rotate your left side rib cage back behind you a little bit more. Inhale, reverse warrior. Keep your legs exactly where they are. Take your right hand up as high as you can towards the ceiling first. Then maybe start to hinge back in space a little bit. Inhale. Exhale, extended side angles. Legs stay to where they are still. Reach as far forward as you can. Then down towards the ground. Breathe here. Right elbow can rest on your left knee. Inhale, reverse triangle. Straighten out the front knee. Sweep your hands up high. We didn't go through this one, but I promise it's the same as triangle pose. Your legs are the same and your hand is just reaching up. Like I said, it's, it's same as triangle, but your hand is reaching up instead of down. Inhale. Exhale, high to low plank, shutter up, mid adasana, bend into your front knee, plant your hands, step your right foot back, shift forward, lower halfway. Inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. Send your hips to the ceiling. Inhale, left toes high, three-legged dog. Square off your hip. Exhale, low lunge. Shift your left knee forward as far as you can get it. Then drop your foot down to the mat. Inhale, crescent lunge. Sweep your hands up to the ceiling. Breathe here for a moment. Stack the left knee over the left ankle. Maybe you start bending your right into your right knee a little bit, then straightening out to get your hips forward and your pelvis nice and neutral. Inhale. Exhale, warrior two. Open up towards the side. Spiral the outside of the right foot down. Left toes still point straight forward. Shoulders over the top of your hips. Inhale, reverse warrior. Take your left hand high to the ceiling. Then maybe start to stretch back. Press your shoulders back away from your ears so you're not lifting your shoulder into your neck. Inhale. Exhale, extended side angle. Shift forward, forward, forward. Then down towards the ground. Right hand goes up. Left elbow is maybe on your knee. But wherever you are, rotate the right side, rib cage open. Inhale, reverse triangle. Straighten the front leg. Take your hands up to the ceiling. Inhale. Exhale, high to low plank. Chaturanga Dandasana. Spiral your hands down. Step your left foot back. Shift forward. Lower halfway. Inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. Take another deep inhale. Exhale. We're going to go through the second half of that again a little bit more quickly. Inhale, right toes high to the ceiling. Exhale, low lunge. Step your right foot in between your hands. Inhale, crescent lunge. Sweep your hands straight up. Exhale, warrior two. Spiral your back heel down. Inhale, reverse warrior. Right hand high. Exhale, extended side angle. Stretch forward as far as you can, then down. Inhale, reverse triangle, straighten your front knee. Exhale, high to low plank, Chaturanga Dandasana. Inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. Last side, inhale, left toes high. Exhale, low lunge, pull your knee to your chest, then step down. Inhale, crescent lunge, sweep your hands straight up, square your hips forward. Exhale, warrior two, back heel to the mat, stretch out your arms. Inhale, reverse warrior, keep your legs where they are. Exhale, extended side angle, right hand high or overhead. Inhale, reverse triangle, squeeze your heels together underneath you. Exhale, 
exhale, high low plank, Chaturanga Dandasana. Inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. Take a deep inhale. Exhale, let go. Moving into some stretches. Inhale, right toes high. Exhale, bend your right knee. Bring your right knee towards your right wrist, your right foot towards your left wrist for a half pigeon. If this hurts your legs, look over onto your seat. Bring your right foot across the top of your left knee. And just pull your knee in towards you. You can lie down on your back and take this on your back as well. So lots of different options for that hip stretch. And as we're hanging out here, if you're on your belly, walk your way down. Find some place for your head to rest. And that's not something that is required for the stretch, but I do want you to be able to relax a little bit. Sink in, the back of your neck. Just release. As we're sitting here, if anybody has any questions, any parts of that flow that the transitions weren't quite clear, they weren't quite sure where they're supposed to go, chime in, type up. Otherwise, you can just stay stretching your outer hip. If you are on your belly, maybe walk your way up to your hands quick. Take a, foot at, uh, take a look at your left foot behind you. So we have this tendency to stickle our feet in in half pigeon. So if your left toes are pointing more towards the center of your mat rather than straight back, see if you can point straight back and press the top of your foot into the mat. Roll down. The other thing is um, we're trying to get our hips even in face. I'm going to grab a towel here. Um, so what happens a lot is we'll be like this. I'm going to turn on this side a little bit. Where this right hip with our right knee bent is lifting up, you can grab something and put it underneath that right hip. So you have something stable to sit on, whether that is a rolled up towel or a blanket or whatever, and then walk your way down. Just a little bit more supported, stable version of that same stretch. As you're ready, Start to lift your chest, curl your back toes under, bend your hips up and back, pedal out your legs a little bit. It's a lot of compression on your legs, so if you felt your toes going a little bit numb or pins and needles sensation in your leg, that's pretty normal. <laughs> You're fine. We've all been there. Then switch it to the other side. Inhale, left toes high. Exhale, bend the left knee, bring your left knee towards your left wrist. Left foot towards your right wrist, point your right toes long behind you, press the top of that right foot into the mat. Again, just start to walk your way down, find someplace comfortable to rest. Maybe on this side, your left hip is wrapped, lifted in space. You want to bring something underneath your left hip, your left thigh to rest onto. Or if this hurts on your knees at all, even if it didn't on the other side, flip over, bring your right foot to the ground your left foot over the top of your right knee. So you can just hang out there in a seat. You can roll this down to your back and take the same stretch on your back. There's nothing wrong with taking different variations that are right for your body, right for the moment that you're in. Um, I've been doing a lot of yoga over the last couple weeks, more than my body is uh, used to on a regular basis. And that means that when I'm in classes, I'm not doing every single pose all of the time necessarily because it's not going to be right for my body. If I have done, you know, two other classes that day and my glutes or my hamstrings or my quads are already burnt out, maybe I won't go into a crescent lunge. Maybe I'll take some variation of that. That is fine. Um, every practice is for you, not for anyone else. So always feel free to take the version of a pose that works for you.
you want to readjust it all in your half crit pigeon, maybe try out a different version of the stretch. Look onto your back or come up to a seat or just bring something underneath your hip. You can do that. And let's all start to make our way through a seat. So if you're in your half pigeon, you can just rise up and swing your legs around in front of you. If you're already in a seat, just release your legs. Let them go along. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about seated forward folds. Um, this pose right here is basically exactly the same as our downward facing dog. If I put my hands up overhead, guess what? That's exactly the same as downward facing dog. So just like that down dog where I had a nice flat back, our goal with a seated forward fold is to maintain that. And just like in down dog, that might mean that my knees then maybe they come all the way up to here. And that's what allows me to keep a straight flat back as I hinge forward over my legs. If you've got hypermobile um, hamstrings, maybe you don't. Maybe your legs stay flat on the ground as you hinge forward. You can grab a towel and bring that around your feet. Um, you can grab a, um, a belt, a strap, Whatever works for you to pull yourself down towards your feet if you're trying to get deeper into that hamstring stretch. But you also don't have to. If you're like, I'm hanging out here and this feels good for me, hang out here. The other thing that you can always do when we come into seated forward folds, because um, that's still a good amount of work kind of in your low back, your back muscles are still pretty engaged there. And if you would rather stretch out those back muscles instead of that pull forward of your chest, your collarbones pulling towards your um, toes, you can take a back stretch. So start from that same seat nice and tall, and then slump. <laughs> let your back round out behind you. Then let your chin fall to your chest. Then roll forward in space like you're trying to drop the top of your head onto your knees. So I've done this stretch already today. I've been warming up a bit. So for me, my head comes pretty much all the way down to your, my knees. Some days I'm like this. If you ask me on like a Wednesday afternoon after I've been sitting in a chair that wasn't meant to be sat in that often for three days out of work, I'm about like this and I can feel this like in the back of my head going all the way up through the crown of my head. And it's pretty, it's a pretty painful stretch for me at that point. So maybe that's where you're at today. You're just hanging out there. You can always build a little tower for yourself, either with your hands, or with a pillow or something else to have something to rest your head on. If you're pretty deep in the stretch and you want to go deeper, you can bring your hands behind the back of your head, let your elbows drop by your ears, and use that as some extra weight to get deeper into the stretch. Um, so again, just a note that um, none of these poses are static. None of these poses are something that a teacher says Go into your seated forward fold and there's only one way to do it and it's always going to look the same. It's going to change by day, it's going to change by time of day, by what you've done the previous days. It's going to be changed by what you need in that day. So maybe some days you're like, I need to stretch my hamstrings. I'm going for that. Sometimes you're like, my hamstrings are fine right now, but gosh, my neck is sore. And take that other version then. Take what's right for you in the moment. Um, there's no compelling need to do exactly what the teacher says at all times. Um, we're going to do a couple little twists for our back. Um, we're going to just hang out in Shavasana for a couple minutes. I'll take some questions again towards the end. As you're ready, use just a little bit of core strength to roll down to your back. Pull your right knee into your chest. Give your right knee a really tight squeeze. Pull it all the way up to your um, armpit almost. Left leg can stay long on the mat. Now, if you, have, um, if you have a pretty tender back, if your back is sensitive, bring your left leg up as well so your shins are parallel to the ground. Tee out both arms to your side so arms go straight up. Gaze over your right fingertips. Press your shoulders down into the mat and then drop both legs to the left side of your body. So your legs are going in the opposite direction than your hand and then you're looking with your eyes. If that felt fine for you and you're like, well, this is kind of a nice twist, but I feel like I could get something a little bit deeper. 
come back towards center, extend your left leg where we started, and then just draw your right leg alone over to the left side of your body. Your right knee does not need to touch the ground. It can and likely will float in space here to do whatever is right for you. If you're in that variation in your life, well, that feels good, but actually, like, my spine is pretty loose, and I would actually like to get deeper into a twist. Bring your knees back up to center. Um, interlace your legs. So bring your right leg over the top of your left, and then circle your right toes along, around behind the back of your left legs. This is eagle legs. It's a standing posture we do with legs like this, with your legs all twisted together, then drop them over towards the left side of your body. Gaze over your right fingers. If at any point you feel your shoulders starting to lift away from the mat, press your left hand or your left elbow back down into the ground to press your right shoulder firmly back down into the mat. Start to bring your knees back in towards center. Give them both a tight squeeze. And then switch them out. Bring your left leg in tight. Let your right leg go long. Left knee comes all the way up to your armpit. And then again, take the variation that's right for you. So maybe that's both knees bent. Both knees go to the side. Maybe just your left knee stays bent. Your right leg goes long. Maybe you're interlacing your legs with your left leg on top of your right this time. And then take your legs towards the right side of your body, gaze out over your left fingertips. Again, your knees do not have to come to the ground, but your shoulders should stay there. Just allow yourself to sink into the stretch a little bit. Change it up if there's a different variation that works better. Maybe it's not the same as what you used on the other side. You can stay here for as long as you'd like to. Just gonna take one more active posture, really more of a stretch together. So as you're ready, start to bring your knees back towards center. Bring both legs into your body. Send your feet up a little bit higher towards the ceiling. Now here, we're going to go into happy baby. So you can just reach for the back of your knees. And maybe that's your version of happy baby today, just rolling around right there. Maybe you reach for your ankles and you roll around there. If you can pull your feet a little bit closer to you, maybe you reach for the inside or for the outside of your feet. The goal is to kind of press your spine down into the ground. I'm pressing hard into my feet to get my entire back flat on the mat. I'm just gonna roll around a little bit, maybe straddle out one leg, straddle out the other leg, and maybe straddle out both legs in space. Take it around. The other thing that often feels good for me, I'll actually let go of my feet. I'll bring my knees into center, place my hands on the top of my legs, on the top of my knees, and I just kind of make small circles with my knees to massage my sacrum, the low piece of my low back. Because that for me is what often kind of gets tight and uncomfortable. It's a really nice way to massage out your sacrum a little bit. As you're ready, start to bring your knees as close as you can to your chest. Wrap both arms around your legs. Take in the deepest breath you've taken all day. Inhale. Exhale, Shavasana. Spread out in your space. Let your feet flop open. Your hands open up towards the ceiling. Readjust anything you need to so that you're comfortable to stay here for a couple of minutes. Flatten out your shoulder blades into the mat. Come up to a seat. Say um, a very famous yoga teacher who was asked um, what he thought the most important pose was for people to learn. Uh, and he said, Shavasana. I love that. Certainly my play, favorite place to hang out. Um, 
when you've worked hard for an hour, it's a really nice place to spend some time. No, don't take You're welcome to stay here. It's gonna just make sure not too many. In the yogic tradition, we talk about Shavasana as the death of our practice. Um, we move from here into fetal asana, which is our rebirth into a new one. We often think in kind of Western culture about yoga as this thing that we do on yoga mats that's physical in nature. Uh, and while that is certainly part of it, um, the tradition behind yoga is much broader than that. And it's about something that is a way of life, it's part of a lifestyle that we can carry with us. The intentionality behind our movements, behind our actions, behind the words that we use. Um, so we spent this last hour focusing on just that movement piece of it. But there are lessons that we learn and that we take away, things we learn about ourselves and our bodies um, that are important and are relevant and that should resonate in the rest of your life. So welcome to stay here if you'd like to. But if you're ready to move on with your day, start to draw some awareness back into your fingers and your toes. Circle out your wrists and your ankles. Rock your head from side to side. Draw your hands high overhead, your knees into your chest. Roll onto one side or the other for a fetal asana. You can use your bicep as a pillow. And then as you're ready, you slowly start to make your way up to a comfortable seat, facing the top of your mat. Your eyes closed, draw your hands to heart center. And draw your hands up to the space between your brows, seat of light and intuition. Any way that is meaningful for you to seal this practice, whether that's with the word namaste or anything else, so you can bow forward, seal your practice. Namaste. Thank you for joining. Thanks for those on Instagram Live as well. Um, you're welcome to send me questions that you have.